Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Come on, we bless your name. Oh, you're worthy, 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 Jesus. You know, Psalms 24 says, The earth is the Lord and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded on the seas and established the waters. But who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? But he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in idols or swear by false gods, and they will receive a blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God their Savior. Such is a generation of those who seek him will seek your face God of Jacob so lift up your heads you gates be lifted up you ancient doors that the king of glory may come in who is this king of glory the Lord strong and mighty the Lord mighty in battle lift them up who is this king of glory but the Lord almighty he is the king of glory He's the king of kings, so lift up your hands, lift up those gates, that the king of glory might come in. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we worship your name. Come on, just for a moment, give a praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. You're worthy of our worship, Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm saying, Lord, create in me a clean heart, renew in me a right spirit, holy fire, won't you burn away this morning, God? Oh, yeah, holy fire, come burn away. That is not of you And is of me Cause I want more of you And less of me Yes, say like holy fire Holy fire Come burn Burn away My desire My desire The red and
hunger and thirst for they shall be filled I don't know about you but I want more yesterday is gone today I'm in need I'm saying Jesus I want more of you strip me of the junk strip me of the things that cloud out my love for you but I want more
right now. That the Lord is saying it's in this, in this presence that he's changing hearts. It's in his presence that he's healing. He says, when my people learn to worship me, when they learn to exalt me, it's in my presence that things begin to happen. Because chains are about to be broken. here. Deliverance is here. Oh, my presence is coming like never before. I am here. I am here. I am here. the captives free to open the blind eyes to bring sight to those who are lost this morning you know uh, David said I was glad when he said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord why because there's deliverance in the house there's healing in the house there's salvation in the house and you know the thing that that gets to me is more or less like why is it so good to come to the house? Because it's not like I ain't got nothing else to do on a Sunday. You know, I tell people it's not like I can't do something else on a Sunday, but I'm grateful. I'm thankful. And I think a part of that is always remembering what God has already done. And you know, David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house. But then I remember when David was facing his giants. And being in the situation he was and the, his, his height, the factor that he was in that situation, facing that big giant Goliath. And you know what he said? You know, he said, I remember when there was a lion and a bear and if God delivered me from the lion and the bear how much more will he deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine you know it was him remembering what God has already done that can give him the hope to say man I can do it again not because of my own strength, but because of what God has already done. So you can run with, and that just shows me, how could David say that? So he said, I was glad when they said it to me, let us go into the house. Why? Because I know what the house represents. I know what my God has already done for me. I know how he's delivered me. I know how he set me free. I know how he's changed this the way to the world. I know it because he knew what God has already done. So he said, let's get into the, hey, 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 I got to get to the house. I got to get to the house, why? Because I got to honor the God that honors me. I got to honor the God that delivers me. I got to honor the God that heals me. I got to honor the God that takes care of me. I got to honor the God that knows me. Better than I know myself. So I got to get to his house. I 
church and just a word for Lakeisha I, I just sense the Lord is saying sure you've got a quiet nature but I'm, I'm calling you I'm calling to the you to the forefront I'm calling you to that place of purpose it doesn't matter the age doesn't matter that there have been times that you've been counted out there have been times that you weren't you were overlooked you weren't even in the number but God said it's not now he said I'm calling you to the forefront there and when you see situations and things going on, oftentimes God is giving you a word. Sometimes a simple word. God says, I want you in this hour to speak it out. I want you to say what I'm saying. Continue to be that word of caution to your family. Continue to be that word of wisdom to your children. God has poured much into you. God is expecting his return. 
Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. I just sense that to the church that the Lord is saying that we're to be an echo of his voice. We're to say what he's saying. In other words, when we're, just, we're sick, we're to say what the Lord is saying. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Because God says his word will not return unto him void, but will and it will accomplish that which is set out to do. We've got to say what God is saying. And not only that, we've got to mirror, mirror the image of God. We've got to walk like he walks. Oh, church, it's no time. It's no time for compromise. Not in this hour. We've got to lay it aside. We've got to come to the place of Jesus. Only you. It no longer matters what I look like. It no longer matters what I sound like. Just you, my Lord. Just you. Just the crumbs from your table, God. Just you. I just want you. Nothing else, Lord God. Not another ring. Not another car, Lord God. None of it matters, God. Just you. Just you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, come on, let's thank the Lord together. Isn't he good? Amen. Thank you, Andrew, for sharing that word. Ronald, thank you for sharing and reminding us sometime, as has been said, you don't need a miracle, you just need a memory. You need to remember what he's done. How many has God been good to you? If he's been good, come on, give him a praise right now. Come on, just give him a, let him know, come on, God, you're so good. Yeah, somebody realize he deserves it. Come on. He deserves it. Come on. Oh, yes, sir. He deserves it. He deserves our best praise. He's so worthy. He's so honest. God, you've been so good. And we love you. You know, God takes great delight. The Bible says he delights. It makes God smile when you and I praise him and let him know how much we love him. Think of a natural father. Nothing brings appreciation to a parent like when a child express gratitude for what they have done. Well, how much more our Heavenly Father, He takes great joy and delight when we praise Him and we let Him know how much we love Him, how much we're grateful. Thank Him for every deliverance, every healing, every miracle, every provision for His peace, every good blessing. Amen. Well, praise God. Thank you so much. Just real quick there's an announcement um next saturday there's going to be a ladies uh get together at at 10 a.m from 10 to 12 next saturday somebody's excited come on anybody else that, that's gonna so so all the ladies excited give god a shout come on <laughs> so a ladies meeting next saturday from 10 to 12 uh, also there's going to be a um outreach for all of our seniors uh, the, if you're 65 and older on Saturday, uh, April 20th from 10 to 12, there'll be an outreach for our seniors and it'll be right here. Is that correct? Right here. Let's thank God for all of our seniors. Come on. Oh, listen, you better give God a shout because you're going to get that one day. I say you ought to do better. Let's thank God one more time for all of our seniors. <laughs> yes. And then also, find, uh, the parish, St. John Parish is sponsoring a team up for clean up. And so if you want to be involved in helping clean up our community, uh, April 20th, Saturday from 9 to 11, people will be going out and picking up uh, trash and debris in the community. Great way to serve your community and be a light. Amen. And finally, there's going to be a marriage couple outreach on April the 27th from 5 to 7 p.m. And so you can find out. One last thing, there's going to be a Beth Moore conference uh, at Celebration Church uh, in June. But we need to know that you're committed to going. So the fee is going to be an $8 uh, registration fee. And so we need as many ladies who are planning to go to the Beth Moore conference at Celebration Church in June. Please uh, plan to sign up on the back table and turn in your eight dollars somebody will be there one of the greeters will be there to collect from your fund collect your 
uh, money. Amen. Well, God bless you. It's so great. Well, isn't it wonderful to be alive in the Lord? Aren't you enjoying this beautiful spring weather? Come on, isn't it God? God is a good God. How many had a wonderful Easter? Did you enjoy the Easter? I tell you, God is so good. Somebody said they had a wonderful Easter. And so we had an amazing time. So we want to take this time. We want to welcome all of you here. Yes, thank you so much, Sam. Immediately after church, there's going to be an amazing giveaway. We have uh, uh, home goods and uh, apply not appliances, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, home, home furnishing and decorations and, and uh, so forth. We, we, many of you know, we get this. Uh, one of our donors was Lowe's Home Goods Store. And so we're going to be giving away goods immediately after church. You can go to the gym and we're going to make it available. Don't rush and don't run over nobody. There's a lots of it. And so, <laughs> so just uh, be respectful and mindful. But uh, if you walk to the gym immediately after service, there'll be a giveaway, a home goods giveaway. Is that, that amen, right after service. And so, um, so again, we want to welcome all of you. Welcome those of you who are tuning in online. If you're tuning in, just put in the chat where you're from. We've been having people contact us from different areas, and we're always excited to hear the good report. We want to thank all of you who have joined us here locally. We have some of you traveled from Atlanta. God bless you. Great to have you here. Thank God for all of you here in the house this morning. And if you're visiting for the first time, there's a visitor's card or decision card in the seat right in front of you. Uh, we'd like to send you a thank you just for coming and joining us this morning. And if you fill that out and turn, give it, turn it into the ushers at the end of the service, we'd love to send you a thank you. Again, if you are wanting to be a member here of New Wine, uh, you can uh, fill out a decision card that's in the seat. We have a, a class called uh, Class 101 that introduces you. What does it mean to be a member of New Wine? Several of you reached out to me last Sunday and said, I'd like to be a member of the church. And so if you'd like to be a member, you can fill out that card and uh, we'd be glad to sign you up to be a part of New Wine family. Amen. Why don't you stretch your hands towards me? Let's just pray one more time. I just believe that when you pray, uh, you know, they, they say if there's fire in the pulpit it's because there's first been prayer in the pew. So stretch your hands and pray for me. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word says where two or more gather together in your name, you are here. And we just want to first of all say, Lord, we love you. We welcome you. We so thankful that you've promised to be with us. We pray now, Lord, that you would use me this morning to preach your word to the end that we would lift Jesus up, that you would be glorified, that you would be honored. And as we proclaim you and proclaim your good news, God, may you uh, do what only you can do. May you heal, save, deliver, change lives today. And God, we promise in advance to give you all the glory and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. This morning, I'm beginning a new series and I've titled it Finding Peace in Our Hectic World. I mean, you know, we're living at a time as never before that the world is desiring peace. They're turning to every kind of thing. They're, they're, they're looking for peace in all the, so many ways. But how many know peace is only found in a person? He's called Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. And uh, uh, I've titled this series, but I'll be, we're going to go through this book together. And I want to invite us to go together. If you want a copy, I gave a copy of all of our leaders. It's called... The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry is a book by John Mark Comer. Excellent book. And uh, I'm going to be going through this for the next five weeks. And I want to invite the whole congregation to join in reading with us, not just our leaders. And if you would like a book, I think a copy of the book is, I think it's $12. We'd order for you. If you'd like to order, you can order it yourself. But if you want us to order, you can sign up on the back table. But... Um, I believe it's going to bless you. I not only believe, I know it's going to bless you. And so this morning, I want to start, I want to talk about breaking free from distractions. 
or, or you know, how, how, do, how do we break, uh, is that what I have on your handout, breaking free? Huh? Yes. Amen. And so, so, so anyway, I want to I wanna minister to you this morning because one of the things that I'm convinced today that the greatest threat to modern Christianity is not heathenism, it's not nationalism, it's not even secularism. It's not even materialism, although we struggle with all those issues in our nation. But I, I believe that the greatest threat to our modern Christianity is living overly busy, digitally distracted, and hurried lives. We're living at a time as never before where more people in our nation are preoccupied. Our time is... Is, is often given away uh, to things that don't matter in eternity. And uh, I believe that hurry is the enemy of spirituality today. Always being in a rush. A great woman of God, Corrie Ten Boone, said it this way. She said, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. And I believe that is so true because busyness and sin both have the same effect. They want to cut you off from the life source. Jesus said in John 15, 5, he said, I am the vine. He said, you're a branch. He said, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you'll bring forth much fruit. But listen to what he said. But apart from me, what? Apart from me, you can do nothing. How many of you know what nothing means? It means nothing. And so the reality is, is that we're living at a time that the greatest, the enemy wants to always cut us off from the source, from being, being too busy that we don't have time to abide. You know the word abide means to remain. It means to be still. It means to tarry. And the word abide means, you know, the NIV say, if you remain in me. In other words, God, how many know you cannot be in a rush and spend time with Jesus? And I believe one of the greatest threats to you and I growing and being all that God wants us to be is sometimes we simply live too busy lives so that you can't notice that there's a correlation between abiding and fruit bearing. Jesus said, if you're going to bear fruit, you got to remain planted. In other words, if you're not learning to stay, and to, to, to remain, to stay plugged in, how many you know you are not going to bear fruit? I, I, I was planting some uh, flowers uh, in my garden and uh, I, I had to transplant some and I've learned that you know uh, when I uprooted some of the plants one, even though it had been very fruitful and productive but when I uprooted it one of them died because I uprooted it from its source well, that's what the plan of the devil is. He wants to uproot you from the sword. In other words, you can't live without Jesus. It's been said, you know, you, if, if you take a fish out of water, what is going to happen? It's going to die. If you take a tree out of the ground, what's going to happen? It's going to die. And if you disconnect man from his source, who is God, what happened? We die. And so the one of the goals of the enemy is to cause you and I to be so busy, so hurried that we don't have time to abide. I'm reading at Luke chapter 10, verse 38 and 42. I just want to read this because I believe that this is what Jesus would say to our society today. In Luke 38, verse 42, it says, As Jesus and his disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Any Marthas in the house? He 
His sis, her sister Mary, you need to underline that in your Bible, sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha, say but Martha, but Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. Anybody in here can relate to Martha? Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all she had to do. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. I like the King James. You are worried about many things. But there is only one thing worth being concerned about. Say one thing. And Mary has discovered it. And it will not be taken away from her. I believe that Jesus would say to this generation, Americans, Americans, you are distracted about many things, but one thing is needful. And I believe that one thing is what the enemy tries to distract us, discourage us, to cause us to get busy in hurried lives so that we don't have time for that one thing. Jesus would certainly say that of this generation. You know, the essence of being a follower of Jesus or, or the focus, the overall focus of God's plan for all of our lives is to live a life of love. That's God's goal. The Bible says we need to make love our greatest aim. The Bible says it to be the number one goal of our lives. Jesus, when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, here it is, love God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, in these two rest all the commandments. But here's the reality. How many know the problem is hurry is an enemy of love? It's hard to spend time loving people when you're always in a rush. It used to be said that love is spelled T-I-M-E. The first quality of love described in 1 Corinthians 13, it says love is first of all what? Well, y'all don't know your Bible. Love is what? Come on, thank God for some people. Love is patient. In other words, love is patient. You can't be in a rush and have healthy, growing, vibrant relationships. In other words, the reason why sometimes we're so barren, the reason why sometimes our relationships are struggling, let me tell you, as never before, I've never seen so many people who are struggling in their marriage relationship, struggling in, their, in just relationships in general. And one of the reasons is because we give no time to our relationship. We got time for everything else. But to invest what was truly important. And Jesus said, listen, this is what's really important. You, if you're going to invest in anything, invest in loving God and loving people. But how many know sometimes we have flipped the script? We got time for everything else but love. And I want you to know if we're going to change, if we're going to, if we're going to find peace in a hectic world, we're going to have to change the way we live. I want to give you all a test and just, just tell me where you, whether, how, you, how you doing. I'm going to ask you six questions. If you, get, if, you got, if you can say four out of six apply to you, you you're in trouble. <laughs> My wife already said I'm in trouble. Listen to her. Here, here, what are the symptoms of a hurried life? How do you know that you're living an overly busy and hurried life? Here's symptom number one constant busyness 
In other words, feeling overwhelmed with tasks, always rushing from one thing to another, uh, never taking breaks, never having time to rest. Does that apply to you? Just say, if so, yes, say, oh me. Amen. Here's number two. A lack of presence. What do I mean by that? Being physically present but mentally somewhere else. Unable to engage. You ever see people, you know, isn't it interesting? We go to people, uh, go to restaurants, people on date night and everybody, they, they're sitting across them but everybody looking at their phone. In other words, we're present but we're not there. Anybody home? And we're living in a generation that we're physically present but we're absent because we're distracted. We're somewhere else. So I want to ask you, is that, does that apply to you? Here, here's number three. Anxiety and stress. We all know that we're living in the most stressed out, anxious generation ever. We have an epidemic of anxiety and stress in our culture today. Anxiety and stress, experience and heightened level of anxiety, stress, pressure due to the fast-paced lifestyle, the never-ending demand. In other words, the current... Uh, um, pace of your life is, is not manageable. You can't keep, you know, this is a, a sign. If you're living at a pace that if you keep on that pace, you're going to either burn out or, you, you, or burn up, one or the other. And, and how many know when you're always going, always, it is going to take its toll on your body. And we have in a generation, let me tell you, many of our health problems are due to the fact that we're living such hurried busy lives here's number four shallow relationships what do I mean by that we struggle to cultivate deep and meaningful relationships because we lack the time and attention to give to others I want to say to every parent in the room especially if you still got children in the house they don't need another pair of tennis shoes. They don't need a new video game. They don't need a, a, a new toy, whatever. They need you. And we're living in the most materially rich nation and the most materially rich time ever. We have enjoyed the highest rate of income that we've ever had. But hear what I'm going to say. We're materially rich, but we're relationally poor. We've never had a time where when we measure people's relationships, their family relationships, their work relationship, their friendships, their relationships in their marriage, we've never had a time where we've been so relationally poor. And so ask yourself, how do you measure your relationships? Are they shallow because of a lack of time? I'm just telling you, no amount of money and things can make up for you and I giving them the priceless gift of time. Here's number five. Physical health issues. Experiencing health issues such as fatigue, insomnia, insomnia headaches, and other stress-related symptoms when you're too busy to get a checkup from the neck up. When you're too busy to take care of your health. So many things can be avoided. I'm speaking to somebody right now. You have a responsibility. Isn't it amazing? How many, you know, Dr. Stacy Green shared this with me. He said, you know, it's amazing how we have a society that they take better cars of the better care of their cars, their automobiles, than they do their bodies. They will go and bring it to the dealership to make sure they have it all changed, make sure they change the fluids and everything, and, and don't even question what the cost is. And yet they don't take time to take care of their body. If we're too busy to take care of our bodies, how I many are we just too busy? And here's the last one. Spiritual emptiness. Feeling spiritually empty and disconnected. Here. Unable to find time for spiritual practices and reflection. We got folks, they're too busy to come to church. They're too busy to read their Bibles. 
They're too busy to have a quiet time with God. They're too busy. Let me just tell you, the symptoms collected when we don't have time to reflect and take time to spend time with you, like I say, to remain, to stay plugged in, then we're too busy. Now, I, I want to be on. How many years before I go, how many years would be on and say, Pastor, to, today, based on that, I'm living a hurried life. Would you raise your hand? Let me just see who I'm speaking to. Some of you are lying, but that's all right. Come on, let, let me say, how, how many of you, if you're beyond, if you're living, come on, if you're saying, God, I, I reckon I'm living a hurried life, just raise your hand, come on. Let, just, let me see who I'm speaking to, amen, thank you. That, that's the vast majority of you, the rest of my line. <laughs> no, that's what I'm just teaching. <laughs> Here, one of the biggest culprits to you and I being what I call digitally distracted is this thing called the iPhone or the cell phone or the smartphone. What a lot of you don't know, and I'm going to encourage you to go out uh, to YouTube. There's a video called, Do Our Devices Control More Than We Think? Here's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a guy who used to work for Google. His name is Tristan Harris. And he said, do you realize there's a small group of people, a few hundred people, who gather weekly to devise ways to control the minds, the thoughts, and the feelings of billions of people. That's right. They gather in rooms. He worked in Silicon Valley, and his whole job was finding ways to make every app, every, every social media app, whatever, to make it so addictive that people won't put it down. I want you to know they're succeeding. Listen what, what, what a, a recent survey said. The average, person, the average iPhone user touches his phone 2,617 times in a day. Did y'all hear that? The average user of a smartphone touches his phone 2,617 times in a day. Now, if you just touched it for five seconds, oh, I just want to see that notification. Y'all might want to put your phone down right now. I just wanted to see what was on Twitter. I just wanted to see what was the latest news. I wanted to see what fake. If, if you did that for about five seconds, listen, that would equal 3.6 hours a day. But most people don't just touch it for about five seconds. If you touch your phone for 10 seconds, that would equal 7.2 hours in a day. Do you know in 20 years, you will have spent six years. I want you to hear that. In 20 years, right now, the average American will have spent six years of his life in just 20 years connected to his smartphone. Here, here's what you got to understand. The, the makers of these apps and stuff, they, they have a plan. They're not, these devices, we don't control them. They're out to control you. The, great, the best way I could explain this to you is using an analogy. How many of you go to the slot machines? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Do you know that the slot machines make more money than all the movie industry and the baseball industry combined? The slot machine, that's a, even though they just put in one quarter at a time, just, just say one quarter. That's how people justify it. Oh, well, I, I'm just going... I, I'm just going to spend $5. I'm just putting $10. I just play the slots. I just put one, one quarter at a time. Hear me. Listen to this. The reality is that by putting in that little bit money, little bit at a time, in the course of a year, every year, they make $35 billion. Now, I want to relate that to your and I smartphone. Because slots are so addictive 
these small amounts of money, just one quarter, it feels inconsequential, but they add up. Like the slot machine, our phones are addictive. A small amount of time, a text here, a scroll through social media there, an Instagram thing here, a quick email there, just a little bit of time. But those small amount of time add, adds up. And listen to what I say. We are giving away our lives a few seconds at a time. How many want to take back control of your life? How many say it's time, it's time for a revolution? It's, it's time to take, look at somebody say it's time to take back our lives. See, you don't realize there are people who are, who are writing and they're spending all that time to figure out how to control your life because they can control your time. They can, they can control how you spend your money. Control, they control what you think. They control. And so you got to realize that there, there is an agenda. What is the solution? What is the solution to our hurried and distracted lives? And I want you to know... The solution is we got to find ways to slow down so that we can connect with the source, which is God. I'm, I'm reading Matthew 11, 28. Here's my text, my text, and I want to speak to you from these few verses for a few minutes. Matthew 11, 28, and I want to read it slowly. Is that all right? This is Jesus saying, this is what he said. Come to me, all who are labor, all who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Who would it learn from? Who would it learn from? Jesus is inviting you and I, learn from me. Listen, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest. Say rest. You'll find rest for your souls. Anybody here need some soul rest? Some peace? For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I want to speak just for the next few minutes. I want to, this is just introduction because for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about how do we learn the way of Jesus. The Bible said Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We have no problem understanding that he's the truth, but we have a difficult time embracing his way. The early followers of Jesus were called followers of the way. In other words, they, they followed a way of living. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He came to show us a way of living. We're to be called followers of the way. In other words, those early disciples, their, their lives were so different from the world around them that they say they are followers of the way. When they looked at the disciples of Jesus because of their manner of life and the way they lived, they could, without them even seeing Jesus, they could say, we can tell that you've been with Jesus. The world was able to look at the way they lived and the way they, the, the, the manner of life, and they were able to see that there was something different. So here's number one. If you and I are going to break free from the trap of business, here's number one. We got to be ruthlessly honest with ourselves. That's why a lot of people can't get free because they, some think they don't have a problem. You know, it's like an addict who, who refuses to admit that they have an addiction. And one of the first things, whether you go to AA or, or celebrate recovery, the beginning of change always starts with acknowledgement and admitting that I have a problem. My name is Neil Bernard, 
and I'm an addict. I said it. It's not until we admit that we have a problem, that we, our lives have become unmanageable, that our lives are out of control. See, whether we, 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 can, we, we think of the crack person who addicted to cocaine or the person who addicted to marijuana or the person who addicted to alcohol, but I'm telling you, we got church people addicted to hurry, addicted to phone, and they squandered it. They, they're addicted to social media, addicted to so many other things. I want you to know, uh, we sometimes trade one addiction for another. But here what we got to do, we got we to gotta be ruthlessly honest with ourselves. Second Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourself. Look at somebody say, examine yourself. Come on, they didn't, they, they didn't hear you. Look at, say, I didn't say examine me, say examine yourself. Come on, tell, tell, tell them, tell them. I say examine yourself. See, the problem is we looking at everybody else, but look at somebody say, you examine yourself. <laughs> so I'm not saying, don't look at your neighbor like that's all. God, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. It's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord. The beginning... So Paul said, examine yourselves and see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. Listen, the first step is to evaluate how you're using your time. Be honest. I didn't realize it. That, that, I'll be honest. I had to go and check for myself what was my average use? All of your phones has a thing called settings. If you click on settings, under settings, there's one called screen time. If you click on screen time, I, I should have gave my media people a little so that they could have it ready. But if you click on screen time, it'll show you what's your average screen time. And it, you can sh look at it by day or by week. And uh, anyway, I, I just pulled up um, last week. I, I, I'm not as good as some folks on these things. So, so anyway, I looked at my screen time from last week, and my average screen time was about five hours, five hours uh, a day. I, w I was using my 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 phone. Um, the problem is, if you break it down, it will show you the apps. Here's when it begins to be a problem. I wanted to look at yesterday's, but I'm having a problem figuring out how to look at yesterday. But anyway, oh, I see it right here, daily. If I look at yesterday's time, I saw that I had Facebook one hour. I had Bible reading eight minutes. Y'all laughing at me. Now you let me see your screen time. Come on, come on. Pull out your screen time right now. Let me see what your screen time is. The reality is, though it was somewhat accurate, I, I read my Bible on my iPad and it didn't record my, I do my daily devotions on my iPad, which you didn't recall. But the reality is, I, I saw, and it shocked me how much time I had for texting, how much time I had for, um, for, for, for Facebook, how much time I had for email. And I was just amazed at how much time I was squandering and I realize that, 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 you know, there's some changes that I have to make. Now, I do, I have a daily time with God. My wife can testify to that. But I, I know that if we as a church, I'm speaking to us as a collective body of believers. I'm speaking to us as a nation of people. I'm speaking to us as the body of Christ. If we're going to begin to 
find peace in a hectic world. If we're going to learn to follow the way of Jesus, then we're going to have to make some radical changes in our lives. And it starts with being ruthlessly honest about ourselves. Here's some of you that struggle with, you can't see it, then ask the Holy Spirit to show you. Listen to what David prayed it this way, Psalm 139. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, I like the NIV, and, and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In other words, we need to invite God to search us and show us our really thoughts. Listen, I had a pastor confess to Angela and I, he said, you know what? For 12 years, he said, I went to bed every night with the television on. My wife and I, we were addicted. We couldn't go to sleep unless the television was on. He said, I did not realize how much time. For 12 years. Some of you are not shocked because you say, well, I do that every night. We have become addicted to noise. We got to have something going on in the background. Because sometimes we can't stand the quietness. Sometimes, I, I, I can relate. I remember when God was trying to get my attention. I remember it clearly. I was a younger believer, and, and I knew that God was wanting to, me to quiet myself and spending time with him. But there was a restlessness going on in the inside of me. And so when I'd come home, nobody was there. I was living in an apartment. My brother Galen and I, we were both at Xavier University, and we were rooming together. And when I'd come home from school, college he he worked he worked nights I worked days and they would get quiet and I knew God was wanting to speak to me but you know what I do I flip on the television because I couldn't stand the quietness and I flip on and after so many days I just felt the Lord said Neil will you quiet yourself long enough so I can speak to you and finally it was a wrestle match I didn't want it to because I was so used to the noise, I couldn't stand the quietness. But how many know God is in the quietness? Y'all know the story when Elijah went up on the mountain, there was an earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. There was thunder and there was fire, but God was not in the fire. There was, there was, there was all of these events, but it said, but God was in the still, small voice. That's why the Bible said, be still. Psalm 46. Let's look at somebody and say, be still. And know that I'm God. That takes a certain quietness to hear from God. And the problem is we wrestle with wrestling. We got a, we got, we got a generation of young people, they'd rather you whip them than take away their phone. I just, some of them just woke up right now. Talk, take away my phone. I did something, take I'm just telling you, we got to generate, they, 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 we, because we're addicted to that device. So I want to ask you, have you taken a ruthless examination of your life? Because you cannot change what you're unwilling to confront. Here's the second part, and here's the thing. We must be, we must be counter-cultural. You know what, what does counter-cultural mean? It means to go against the grain of society. It means to go completely against where the society is doing. Do you know that right now? I want you all to hear this carefully in the church. Our world is looking for peace. They're trying it in yoga. They're trying it in Buddhism. They're trying it in meditation. They're trying it in incense. They're trying it in every kind of thing. Listen, they're, they're, they're looking for it. Isn't it sad? Because sometimes they come to church and they don't find it in church. If anybody ought to be able to be people of peace, it should be us. The Bible said the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but his righteousness is peace and his joy in the Holy Spirit. But we're living in a society that the world is looking for peace. 
but they're looking in all the wrong places. There's a rise in the use of cannabis and marijuana because they made it legal. Now we think we got Christians who think it's okay to smoke dope. I said it. Oh yeah, how do I know? But I smell it on you. I get shocked sometimes. I got I mean I'm talking about born again believers. Smelling like they've been smoking. Well, what you smoking? Let me leave that alone. Let me leave. Because I, I, I feel somebody about to throw a rock at me. me. <laughs> but to break free from our busy and hurried lifestyle, it will require you to go against the grain. The best way I can illustrate it is, is, is anybody saw the movie for richer or poor? Anybody saw the movie for richer or poor? With Tim Allen and Chrissy Alley. Anybody? Well, let me, let me tell you, since y'all didn't see the movie. Tim Allen and, and Christy were two rich um, New Yorkers. They were having marital problems, and they discovered they were having financial problems. And the IRS was after them. And so they flee. In their effort to flee, they find themselves in Pennsylvania, and they get uh, they run it. They run their car into a swamp in Pennsylvania, and they end up on an Amish uh, farm or in an Amish community. And here, are these two New Yorkers, who used to the busy, hurried life, they now living among an Amish community. And it's so radical. Remember, their marriage was. They were about to divorce. They were in all kind of problems. They had no peace. But slowly, as they lived among the Amish, they began to slow their pace of lifestyle. They began to adjust how they acted towards one another. And slowly, they began to fall in love with one another again. And by going among people who had a completely different culture they began to adjust their lives and by adjusting their lives they recovered their lives and they began to find joy and they began to fall in love with one another and they had peace how I many you know when you don't have no tv when you have no radio when you don't have no cell phone <laughs> The reality is, I'm not saying you got to become an Amish to find peace with God. Can I have an amen? The analogy is this, that, listen, today, the Amish and the Mennonites are, are countercultural uh, people. They, they, they selectively, they, they use technology selectively. They don't have televisions in their homes. They don't have radio in their homes because they want to be able to maintain a certain quiet and peaceful way of living. They don't use automobiles, at least the Amish do, because they feel that their lives would become rushed and hurried. Now listen, I'm not saying you got to give up your car. I'm not saying you got to throw away your TV. For some of you, you need to do that. <laughs> what have I got myself into? The reality is, is this. Christianity has always been countercultural. The way of Jesus has always gone against the grain of society. The problem is we're living in a day that too many of us, there's no difference between you and your lost neighbor. There's no difference between you and your lost coworker. There's no difference between you and the lost world around you. You're as stressed as they are stressed. You're as hurried as they are hurried. Your relationships, you fight just as much as they fight. You, 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 you absorb the materialism just as much as they absorb the material. So there's no difference. And this is why I'm going to lose most of you because you're not going to want to hear the rest of the message. Because if you want to experience the life of Jesus then you got to be willing to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. I'm going to say that again. 
if you and I want to experience the life of Jesus. He said, I came that they might have life and that more abundantly. Life to the full. I want to ask you, are you currently living the full, rich, abundant life that Jesus came to give? The reality, most of you already acknowledge and raise your hand and say, my life is hurried, busy, frantic. And the reality is that sometimes we do not have time for the very one who's the giver of life. And so I'm saying to you, Jesus said, come to me. Not to cannabis, not to yoga, not to me. Listen, I'm not saying, listen, the reality is, is peace is found in a person. It's in Jesus. Jesus said, come to me. Come to me. And I will give you rest for your soul. Change, listen, this is, what, this is why it's, why we lose most of it is because change is a process and it's often difficult and it's hard. The Bible doesn't make any bones about it. Listen to what Paul wrote in Galatians. He said, the sinful nature wants to do evil. I'm reading out of the living by the, 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 the King James say, the, the sinful nature is at war with the with the with the with the nature with the the nature of the the flesh is at war with the nature of the spirit. So, but listen, what it, I like, the Living Bible says: this, the sinful nature wants to do the de- wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desire that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. The two forces are constantly fighting each other. Did y'all hear that? There is a war going on in each of us. There's two forces that are battling in each of us. He said, so listen, so, so, you, so you're not free to carry out your good intentions because there's a constant war. The, the desires of the flesh are at war with the desires of the spirit. Paul described this experience, the, the, str- the struggle against sin that we all deal with. Paul said, I don't really understand myself. I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. And some people stop there and they don't find the solution. The solution is, is in Jesus. The solution is we can't overcome in human willpower. The solution is God has given us the Holy Spirit. To overcome sin. Somebody will give God a shout, right? Say, God, thank God for the Holy Spirit. Come on. The Holy Spirit who lives in us, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Come on. The reason we can live resurrected lives is because the same Spirit that raised Christ from the grave now lives in you. Come on. You don't have to work for it. He lives in you. Give God a praise. He's on the inside of me. And greater is He that's in me. I can live the way God wants me to live because the Spirit of God lives in me. Come on, just thank God. Say, thank you, Holy Spirit. Come on, come on, invite him right now. Listen, just begin to thank God right now. God, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. He lives on the inside of me. He gives me power. Come on, I have power. Jesus said, I give you power. The power is the power. It's the power to live counterculture. It's the power to live the way we ought to live. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us the power to live different you can't do it in your own strength oh but he gives us power i like that he, isaiah isaiah caught a glimpse of that he said even young men shall fall you shall fall and young men shall shall utterly fall away but those who wait on the lord he'll renew their strength they'll mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary And they shall walk and not faint. I'm telling you, there is a source of power. I'm I'm fascinated by power. Anybody like power? There's a power source. It's 
is, is, is stronger than anything in your home, is stronger than 110, stronger than 220. I'm talking about the power of the Holy Ghost. When you plug into God, come on, when you, listen, if, when you learn to plug into that source, oh, I want you, there's a, there's a power to give the, to live the overcoming life. There's a power to, to love, the, to love the unlovely. There's a power to be patient. There's a power to be kind. There's a power to walk in holiness. There's a power to live right. There's a power to say no to the devil. There's a power to say no to the adulterous woman or the adulterous man. I'm talking a power to live holy. I'm talking, there's a power to live for God. And we got to plug into that power. Beat me up. Come on, somebody. I'm talking, when you plug into that power, I'm talking, you get power. You can't do it in your own strength. But I'm talking about, I've discovered there's a power to live holy. There's a power to, like, like one, uh, we had a, a, a woman evangelist named Sister Peggy. And she said, there's a power to live right, to, to walk right, and to spit white. Come on. <laughs> you know, for those who, who, who dip, you know, and they spit brown. She told that there, 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 God, there's a power to give you, to get you free from dip. Can I have an amen? And, and snuff. And, and whatever else, and tobacco, whatever else you're putting in your mouth. Uh, say power. power. And that power is in the Holy Spirit. And so here I close with this. For the next four weeks, we're going to look at the habits of Jesus. Listen, I say we, we got to be counterculture. This, most of you don't want this message because you don't want to be counterculture. You want to fit in the world. You want to look like the world, act like the world. You don't want to, because if you dare to be counterculture, the world will hate you. Jesus said they hated me and they'll hate you. But they're actually, listen to it, we have what they're looking for. They're looking for peace. And it's in Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Here, here's the last thing I close. Matthew eleven twenty. I want to read it out of the Message Bible. And this is my altar call for some of you right now. I'm, I'm ending. Listen to what it says. I want to read Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. I have it on your outline as well. But listen to what he said. Are you tired? I just asked you a question. I'm, 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 I'm reading it, but are you tired? Some of you, are, 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 are you worn out? Are you burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. How many want that for your life? How, how many want that for your life? Just, just, uh, if you want that for your life, just stand right now where you're. We, we're we're concluding. I, I the next several weeks, I'm going to be talking. The next four weeks, my I, along with other ministers, we're going to be ministering on the the way of Jesus and the habits of Jesus, and we're going to be talking about how how do I experience this life, this way? Jesus said, "I'm the way, the truth." And the life. How do we walk in the way of Jesus? That's what we're going to be talking about. But I, I want to ask, there's some here, you came this morning, and I don't know your situation, but if you're here, church pray. If you're here and you'd be honest, I want to speak to two people first, two groups. And Jesus is asking you the question today. Are you worn out? Is there an emptiness in your life?
Is there a void? You've tried to fill it with other things. I'm telling you, the only thing that can fill the emptiness, the void, the longing of our hearts is a relationship with Jesus. And if you're here and you say, Pastor, that's me, you'd speak it to me. I'm talking about those who you say today, I need, I want to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, just slip your hand up right where you are. I want to pray for you. I see that hand, man. Anyone else? I see, anyone else? A anyone help me? Anyone else say, I need, yes, I see that hand, young lady. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, young lady. Thank you. Thank you. A anyone else? Here's the second thing. There's some of you here. Here's the reality. You can in church, but the reality is, is this. Jesus, you'd be honest and you'd say, Pastor, I'm so, I've been, my life is so out of kilter that I'm backslidden. But today, you know, I want to reconnect with Jesus. I'm speaking to those you may be today. You came and you convicted that you're backslidden. But you need to say, I want to reconnect with Jesus. That's you. Would you slip up your hand? I want to pray for you. And I see that hand, sir. See that hand, young man. I see that. Any others? Amen. Well, good. Listen to what I want you to do. I want to pray for you first because it starts with connecting to him. This is what Jesus says to those five of you that raise your hand. This is what he says to you. He said, I stand at the door knocking. God wants to come in, but he's a, he has to be invited. Christianity is not a religion of dues, but it's a relationship that he's already done it for you. He's already died on the cross. For you. He took your place, and it's a matter of you just receiving. And those five of you, just say this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, Thank you for dying for me, for taking my sin on a cross, that you died and you was buried and that you rose again for me. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner, but I believe that you're the Son of God. I ask you now, forgive me, Lord, come in my heart fill me give me that abundant life today with my mouth I now confess that you are my Lord in my heart I believe that you love me that you died for me so I can be saved thank you Lord for saving me in Jesus name amen come on let's thank God for those who prayed that prayer listen this is what I want you to do there, there's a card in the seat in front of you a decision card today just write it down today I either I gave my life to Jesus or today I recon, re made a fresh decision some of you may be here and say you know I'm 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 not connected to a church. Ronald said it earlier. Listen, the church is the body of Christ. God has called us to a relationship and to be planted in the house of the Lord. And if you're not a part of a local church that you have, you can say, that's my pastor and I'm accountable to him and I allow him to speak in my life. Today, you can make a decision and say, I want to be a part of a local church. You can fill that out, take that call and fill it out and give it to the ushers and we'll be glad to uh, let you know how you could attend a new members class and learn about what it means to be a member of this church. The last thing I want to do is I want to pray for us as believers. I believe this message wasn't just for me. I believe it's for all of us today. I believe it's for the American church. I believe that we need a friend. We need to, we need to take a fresh assessment. We need to, secondly, we need to be counterculture. This is going to be difficult. I'm just telling you because it goes against the grain. I'm a type A person. I like going all the time. But I'm telling you, I, I, I want to confess my sins to you. 
I've gone sometimes months without taking a Sabbath, taking a day off. And I'm telling you, I was so convicted. Because if you're too busy to take a day off and be with Jesus, you're just too busy. But God has convicted me and I'm changing. I'm, I'm willing to make radical changes in my life so I can reorient my life around being with Jesus. And I'm going to invite you to join me. If you want to join me, say, Pastor, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of people who are going to be followers of the way, the way of Jesus. That we're going to live lives radically different from the world around us. So that we can live in the joy, in the peace, in the love of the Lord. All of you standing because you, you want that. Just say this. We're, we're going to pray together. We're going to make a declaration of faith. Say, Lord Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you for bringing a way of living. That, Lord, that you teach us, you teach us how to shoulder life's burdens and responsibility. You have an easy yoke. And today, I commit to taking your yoke upon me, your way of life upon me. I surrender my life to you. Teach me, Lord, how to walk in the easy yoke. For you say your burden is easy and your yoke is light. Lord, fill me today with peace. I choose to break free from the trap of busyness and distraction. I'm going to take time to abide, to wait, to tarry, to remain in you. And you remain in me that my life will bring forth lasting fruit. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Amen. Come on, give God a shout all over this place. Now listen. Because I just talked about not rushing, nobody going to rush to the gym today. Y'all going to walk slowly. And what God has for you is for Listen, if you're giving today, we want to bless the offering. Thank you for your generosity. It's your giving that makes it possible for us to serve and bless our missionaries and do the work of God. And so I want to pray over you as we pray over your offering. May God bless the giver. Bless those who support this church with their tithes and offerings. God, I pray that you are calling you where you rebuke the devourer. God, that you uh, open windows of heaven over their lives, over their home, over their family. I pray that you'll give them favor with you and favor with men. Meet every need in their lives. God, we promise to give you the glory and the praise. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.